question I ask of those who sail on the surface of the ocean is, have you ever thought about what's under the boat? And sometimes I get a very thoughtful expression like, hmm, no, I really haven't. I must admit, all these years of sailing, growing up sailing, I know the shades and the colors of the sea, the shapes of the waves, but I never thought too much about what's underneath. Only much later, I was struck that scientists explained to me that the oceans are really Earth's air conditioning system. They absorb almost all the energy, the excess heat energy of global warming, because they are not just covering so much surface, but also reach so deep. When we sail fast over the ocean, we can't look into the water except a few very rare moments in the doldrums maybe where it's uh, no wind and the sun is almost vertical and then you can manage to see these sun rays going deep in the water and um, other than that, it's, uh, it's really a view on the surface. So the high seas are the areas of the ocean that lie beyond the national jurisdiction of any one nation. So essentially they make up half the planet if you think about the, the Earth, 70% of the Earth is ocean. And 64% of that, so two-thirds of the ocean, are the high seas. What I have found is, you know, you do all of this research in a lab, and what you find is that this amazing work is being published, but it's not actually being communicated to the public. A lot of what I do in my advocacy, that I categorize as scientific storytelling, allows the public to be educated. It allows for young people to be educated. And more importantly, it brings overall awareness to what is happening in the high seas as well. The thing is, the high seas serve as what the term that humans use is it's the global commons. It's where everybody uses the benefits, that is, from the generation of oxygen, the capturing of carbon, the heart of the planet. It's basically the, the biggest part of Earth's life support system, the high seas, half the world, until the latter part of the 20th century, and now moving into the 21st, the high seas you know, was in pretty good condition. That is, we did not have the capacity for all the things that now have changed. So, defaulation of the ocean, especially now on the high seas, is, is a reality essentially half of what was there when I was a child, when I began exploring the ocean in the 1950s as a young scientist. They're gone. Actually, 90% of the sharks are gone. The bluefin tuna in the Pacific, the numbers are under 3% of what was there when I was a child. In the span of one lifetime, the damage we have inflicted on our life support system, the ocean, the blue ocean, generates most of the oxygen, captures most of the carbon, drives climate and weather, shapes the chemistry of the planet. That's the high seas, half of the world. We're looking at massive destruction, geological change in one lifetime. There's a lot of despair in the world when it comes to the state of the natural world. But deep sea mining, which is, a ne is, is an impending disaster, a new form of ecocide, is something we have time to stop before it starts. If people understand and, and, and can relate to why the, you know, to the ocean and start understanding why it matters to them, then there is then there's you know more incentive to protect it i mean people protect what they know and they know what they love so we need to get uh, as many people as possible engaged and connected to the ocean and that will give agency to people imagine if we can stop deep sea mining from starting then we are giving agency back to all of us in terms of what we can achieve if we work together 
coming from a research background, for me, being able to spend time in the ocean and take that and communicate it to the public has always been something that has been very important in making sure that environmental advocacy efforts, um, specifically those surrounding the ocean and the climate, can move forward. And so for me, being surrounded by very passionate young people in this space and kind of being able to move this work forward has been what has kept me driven throughout all of this. The other thing that gives me real optimism is that people are beginning to recognize their own superpower. We're all humans, but you're no two alike. I think about the octopus teacher, one person who had a way with an octopus and then told a story that caught the attention and the imagination of people all over the world. So when people say, I'm just one person, I don't know what I can do. I say, look in the mirror. You have your own superpower I don't, that I don't have. Everybody has something that makes them whoever, whatever they are. And it's just a matter of using it, finding that thing that you love, that you can do, that nobody else can do. And maybe if we work together, maybe we can make a bigger difference than either of us could do alone. It's rare in life, huh? Kind of moments like this. Very impressive. The vastness of the ocean. And I try to think what's underneath. I think of Sylvia Earle, who I met in uh, New York, and she, uh, she reminded me to, to not forget what's underneath. This big world we're sailing above, we, we spend most of the time inside this cabin, and what I see is computer screens and sheets. Uh, the walls of my cabin but look out a bit through the windows into the sails but I, I don't look much at the sea so I do a bit more today.